actually. Is the presentation visible? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, we have had a lot of uh, discussions on uh, type systems. And uh, we have been taking a closer look into the type system of uh, C++, one of the uh, relatively complex type system that the contemporary programming languages have. And uh, we have talked at length uh, about the type deduction, particularly uh, in the context of uh, polymorphism. And we looked at uh, multiple types of polymorphism, primarily categorized in terms of ad hoc polymorphism and parametric polymorphism, nominative and structural. And we have, we see the interrelationships between them and got some idea about what uh, additionally the type system has to do beyond uh, just uh, you know inferencing of the of the type uh, that they get from the declarations and uh, the different kind of rules that uh, uh, C++ kind of language apply. Uh, before we conclude, uh, I would like to just uh, uh, take your attention to some of the newer features of uh, C++, particularly these are available in C++ uh, 11, uh, which uh, really make uh, the programming uh, easy, uh, less error prone, compact, uh, more reusable and so on, uh, efficient also, you know, uh, in terms of this. But uh, certainly all of these have consequences in terms of the type system. So we are just trying to look at uh, from that perspective. So in this, uh, I have just selected top three um, features uh, that uh, C++ 11 brought in uh, for convenience and, uh, you know, have deep consequences in terms of the type system that the language has. So, <clears throat> We start with the first uh, feature, which is uh, called auto. Uh, you may be aware that there was a keyword called auto in uh, C as well. It meant something uh, different. And this is one case where uh, the backward compatibility has been broken uh, because uh, that keyword was, uh, you know, rarely used uh, in, uh, in C and subsequently in C++ uh, 98, C++ 03. And it has been given a completely new semantics. So this is what uh, we have seen a little bit of uh, this uh, earlier too. I will just uh, uh, highlight it for completeness. So suppose uh, on, the, on the left, uh, you see a typical C++ uh, code, 9803 code, where you have a map, which is uh, like a hash table. Uh, of uh, string and uh, string. So it's name value pair. Uh, string being used as a uh, key to take out the corresponding string. So you have uh, this in the STL component called map. And M is a map. Now, if I want to iterate on this uh, uh, map to uh, find out an element or to say print the elements, uh, the name value pairs, and so, so on. I need to define an iterator on it, so which is also available in the STL map. So I define map string string colon colon iterator. It's quite a long declarator for the type. And then a variable it, the iterator for it, and initialize it with the beginning of the map, which is m dot begin. In contrast, in C++, uh, you can uh, get away by just writing auto instead of this long statement. Uh, map string string colon iterator. You can just say auto it initialized with m dot begin. What the type system has to do is uh, again based on uh, inferencing. Uh, it knows the type of m. 
uh, it knows the type of the method begin in that uh, template class, which necessarily is an iterator. So it gets that m.begin actually gives you an iterator. It gives you kind of a, I mean, we can loosely call it a pointer, but more in the English sense, not in the programming language sense. Something that points to uh, the beginning element of the map. And we are initializing auto with that. So given m dot m, this ex given m dot begin, uh, this expression, the type system can deduce the type of it as m map string string colon colon iterator. And therefore, you don't need to write it. it from the initializer, it takes the type and puts that. Le relieves you of uh, remembering this uh, complex uh, type expression. Another, for example, we have seen singleton. So this is a singleton static call, singleton colon colon instance. And uh, that returns the reference to the current single, the present singleton object, singleton reference. You can get rid of uh, writing that by just saying auto because it knows again from the uh, signature of the static function that it returns a reference to a singleton object and auto will deduce that. In simpler terms, if I have uh, t star p, t is some type and we have t star p, a pointer to that type and I do new t, I can get rid of writing this uh, t star by saying auto. From new t, you know it is, a, it is an object of the type t star, right? So that is a purpose of uh, auto becomes very very convenient in uh, you know simplifying complex type expressions uh, which can be deduced from the initializer so uh, auto mechanism can be used to deduce type from initializer so int x is a potentially uninitialized declaration uh, we we'll, what you'll have to write as uh, int x if you write auto x2 that will be an error if you very clearly, because uh, if you are saying auto x2, then there is no way for the type system to know what is the type of x2. Uh, so it deduces the type from the initializer. So if you write auto x3 initialize zero, then this will be a valid, uh, well defined uh, declaration using auto because it knows the type of the constant uh, zero to be int and it will deduce that type for the expression and set the type of x3 as this uh, type int. In a little bit more complex uh, situation, uh, if you see the uh, second part of the template declaration of uh, printing all components of a ve vector, then uh, for you need to define a iterator p for that. So that iterator p has to be of type vector t. So you are writing that and you are saying that it is a type variable, so type name. And it has to be a const iterator because uh, the vectors that you are iterating on, the components that you are iterating on, uh, you cannot change them. So that the vector you cannot change. So it's a const iterator. So it's a complex, I mean, quite a, quite a long stuff that you'll have to remember and write type name. Uh, vector template t colon colon const iterator instead in, and initialized with uh, v dot begin because that's where the that's where the iteration starts at the beginning of the vector instead you could simplify this by just writing auto so again it knows the type of uh, v as const uh, vector t reference <clears throat> so it notes the type of uh, begin is an iterator and because um, uh, there is a const in the vector, it can also deduce that the type of the iterator is a const iterator. That is, it cannot change the vector. So this whole thing can be deduced. So it's, it is a significant uh, you know, um, uh, help in terms of uh, you know, simplifying the uh, type expressions in, in C++11. We'll, we'll see deeper examples of this when we have discussed the next uh, feature. And the next one is an interesting one, uh, which says decl type or declaration type. That is, uh, it is an operator, again, a type operator, uh, where you can query the type of an expression. 
you can actually query the type of an expression. You will not get that as a as any expression value or something, but uh, you you can use it as a as a type itself. So it's like a size of operator which can query on that type and give you the size. Here the uh, op, uh, the decal type is also a an uh, an an operator on the type system, which uh, lets you get the type of the expression. And similar to size of decal type does not evaluate the expression that you give it to. It just to try, tries to deduce the type of that expression and uses it subsequently. So let's look at these two columns on left. Uh, the um, present uh, C++ 98 or 03, where I have declared i as an integer with initializer 4, a const uh, j as integer initialized, const uh, k uh, reference, a const uh, reference to, uh, const reference to int uh, initialized with uh, i, mm, uh, then an array of uh, integers, then a pointer to integer, and so on. So the same thing I have done in, on the right column in C++11 as well. Now we have a whole set of declarations. So here is show that how you can uh, actually avoid writing uh, the actual type and use decal type for doing that. For example, here for var1, we have the type int. We have already declared int i to be of type int. So we can say decal type i. So what will be decal type i? Decal type i is the type of the variable i, which is int. So that int will be used. Or I can simply say that decal type 1, because it's a constant of the int type. So this will also mean int type. Or I can say decal type 2 plus 3. Here 2 plus 3 will not be evaluated to 5. But 2 plus 3 is taken by the type system. It uh, infers that uh, 2 and 3 are given constants of the int type. They have int types. Uh, it will uh, check that there is an operator which takes two ints and returns an int. And therefore, the type of 2 plus 3 is int. So you have int here. To de uh, <coughs> define a reference type like uh, int ampersand, you could use uh, uh, i assigned 1. Now, when you use i assigned 1, you are actually not making an assignment. But you are using this assignment expression. Naturally, for the assignment expression, uh, the type has to be the L value, the address. So it is a reference. This actually is a reference uh, type. So the type of I assigned one is uh, int ampersand. So the decal type will be int ampersand here. Similarly, J is uh, const int, so you can use decal type of J. K is const int reference, so you can use decal type of K. A is an array of uh, int of size 5. So you can use uh, that to define decal type of A to define VAT3. You could use any specific uh, element, A3, which is uh, an L value, and uh, define a reference type here. You could uh, use the uh, decal type of star P, which is uh, also an L value, which will be in reference and so on. So this is how you can use the decal type. Obviously, in these examples, which are pathological, uh, you would wonder why would you use the decal type? I mean, maybe at times, yes, but then uh, most often uh, they are more effort to write. But let me take you very interesting examples of where you would need that. And much of it happens in terms of the template uh, meta programming, uh, which is the the biggest uh, addition to the type system of a language like C++. So decal type E is a declared type of the name of the name or expression E and can be used in the declaration. So suppose you are trying to write a function to um, uh, involving two vectors, vector A and vector B. And uh, what you want to do is uh, the inner product of these vectors. So you would like to actually uh, keep on multiplying A0 with B0, A1 with B1, and so on. Now, if, if you do this multiplication of uh, AI with BI, then you get a new object, which is the multiplication. Remember, this is, this is uh, you, you, you are writing 
in, in general, uh, in, in terms of uh, types we, which you may not explicitly know. So you will have to give a type to the product of AI and BI. Right? So how do you define that type? It will have to be float. Think of that. They could be anything, actually. So one way could be you could say that, well, the if uh, A is a vector, then A0 is a vector element. So it has a type, uh, which in this case would be int. B0 is a vector element, which is, uh, again, of uh, uh, the type float in this case. So you define an expression A0 times B0 and leave it to the type system to deduce that type. Right? So whatever that type is, you are saying that whatever that product type is, is uh, said to be the type of type TMP. So you are doing a type def, saying that this is my temp type, which is a type of the product of two elements of the vector. And uh, then you can create the new product elements by uh, doing AI into BI and uh, creating a temporary object, uh, uh, you know, dynamically with that and put it to this pointer and then do whatever logic is. But the crux of the thing is, it is uh, how do you get this uh, TMP type is by using the nickel type here, right? So that's, that's the kind of uh, place where you can use it. But we are going to show you something even more interesting. Think about uh, you are trying to define a template to multiply uh, elements of two classes. Class T and class U. And you do not know what they are. So this mul function, which will return x types y, what are you going to say its uh, return type is? It's not uh, at all obvious how you write this because you do not know type T, you do not know type U, you would not know what the multiplication type they have because it depends on the kind of uh, you know overloading that it might have and so on. So uh, you, you would say, okay, decal type gives a solution. So you do a decal type, decal type of X into Y and mul TX TY. Uh, UI. But this uh, will not compile for the simple reason that you have a scoping problem. In, in C++, always anything that you use, any variable that you use, must have been declared with this type. Otherwise, the type system has no way. Type system is processing x times y before it has seen that x is of type T and y is of type U. So this comes in the scope before x and y has been, uh, the type of x and type of y has been specified. So this will not be, the compiler in the framework will not be able to handle that. You have a scope problem. So uh, then you try to do the trick that we did uh, in the last uh, example that uh, could I, could I some, in some way get a constant of that type t and, uh, uh, and a constant of the type uh, u. Uh, irrespective of knowing what they are and use the, the uh, product of these constants to get the type. Well, I mean, there is a way. For example, uh, for any type, you can have a pointer type. So T star is a pointer type of T. And for any pointer type, there is a universal constant zero, the null pointer. So you can take zero, which is an int constant otherwise, and cast it to T star, C style casting. So you have cast it to T star. So this becomes uh, an object of T star type. Then you dereference that by doing a star. So star within parenthesis T star within parenthesis zero, this whole expression is a constant uh, zero in type T, right? Whatever that means. Similarly, you can you can do that for u. You can take zero, uh, 
take a uh, pointer of uh, type u and cast the zero to that pointer type d reference and then you do a multiplication this star is for the multiplication of these two constants so naturally the type of you are not evaluating this so don't get worried about the fact that you are taking the the dereferencing of a null pointer not none of that problem you are going to have because decal type expressions are not evaluated they're just for the type system to know the type so this will give you the type an element of type t this will give you an element of type u the multiplication will give you whatever that uh, type is in the context of the actual instantiation of type t and type u so you are no more using x and y you are get gotten read of the scope problem and e this declaration will certainly work but uh, certainly this is this is something which is very difficult to use in general and kind of uh, quite uh, ugly and error prone solution so what do you do you put the uh, return type where it actually belongs that is after the function has been i mean function parameters have been declared so you say multi x uh, ui an uh, arrow which means the mapping here not the uh, pointer dereferencing decal type xy now you do not have the scope problem because x and y have been declared so you have the decal type but actually your return type has to happen according to the syntax uh, of uh, function header has to happen before the function name so you have to write here so what you do is you say it is auto right auto is a deduction mechanism of a type from the context so the type system now knows the decal type from a type of x and type of y it can get the type of x term types y and uh, auto says that whatever type is deducible is the is the type here so it sets it at the return type so this is a this is a beautiful uh, solution and this is a very perfect way of uh, using decal type and since here you write the return type uh, at, as a suffix not as a prefix which is typical in uh, uh, c c++ function you this is called a suffix return type uh, syntax and the return type can be deduced here so you can see that uh, uh, beautiful things can be done very fun things can be done using these kind of features and uh, you can write more and more powerful uh, generic uh, statements generic programs with this but that is the consequent that is based on the inferencing that these type systems can do right so this was uh, auto and uh, decal type uh, i'll move into a third uh, which actually is uh, is a very beautiful addition and particularly um, uh, important in terms of the uh, efficiency of c++ program so this is the context suppose x is a class that holds a pointer in general or a handle to some resource it could be handle to a database handle to a socket whatever as a point i mean we can think easily in terms of we are more familiar with pointers to memory resources so we could think in terms of that so it holds a pointer say mp resource in a member of pointer type called resource mp resource by a resource we mean anything that takes considerable effort to construct clone that is may make copy of or destruct so this is what i mean you would not uh, typically talk about an int as a resource here you know it's 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 easy to construct and destruct uh, so it could be a vector it's a big could be a vector big collection of objects that are live in an array of allocated memory now if you have a copy constructor for this class x uh, which takes uh, this kind of a <coughs> i'm sorry parameter you know that copy constructor has to take a constant reference parameter of the same type because uh, it, it is copying from that and you do not want that copy to change right so what you do you have to now in this is rhs is one object that you are copying from 
and the object on which uh, object that will get created not on which object on which that you that will get created uh, yeah I'm, I'm sorry i'm sorry i'm very sorry uh, we are talk, not talking about copy constructor we are talking about copy assignment operator i'm very sorry please correct so this is a copy assignment operator so there's an object current object on which this assignment operator has been invoked so rhs is getting assigned to that so what will happen the resource of rhs will have to become the resource of the current object which means that uh, since rhs cannot be changed you need to make a clone of what rhs dot mp resource refers to it may be it's referring to a vector now mp resource in the current object is referring to some resource right because it's it was in operation so you cannot just uh, assign the rhs dot mp resource to the mp resource of the current object because it will leak that resource so you have to destruct the mp resource here and then you have to attach the cloned resource to mp resource so this is this is typically what we do and and uh, we, we we you know we could check for self assignment and so on but this is typically what we do in case of a copy assignment operator we take the resource uh, from the source object make a clone copy of that and destruct the resource that is currently held by the object and then we take up this uh, clone as the current resource right so similar thing you can <laughs> will apply to copy constructor as well uh, now suppose x is used as uh, <coughs> uh, there's a function foo which uh, returns uh, a value of type x and uh, there's a variable x of type x and perhaps uh, we can use x in various ways and uh, then we invoke function foo and assign to x so what will this last line do? It clone the resources from the temporary object. What is foo returning? Foo is returning by value. So since it is returning by value, it has constructed, copy constructed a temporary object of type X, which is returning. So this is on the right hand side, what you see is basically a temporary object of type X. So that temporary object is returned by foo. Then and and uh, since it is a temporary object whatever uh, you know return object that foo had constructed it had to make a copy of that because it is getting out of scope so it had to make a cons copy construction for this temporary object now when you do this copy assignment what will you typically do clone the resource from the temporary return by uh, foo like in here so you'll have to clone it because you are i mean by assumption you cannot change uh, the source object, which is the temporary return by foo here. Then the destruct the resource held by x, because x would already hold some resource, and replace that with the clone that you have uh, cloned from the temporary object. And uh, then finally destruct the temporary, because this was a temporary object. So after the copy assignment has happened, this temporary object returned by foo will have to be destructed. So it was constructed while returning by value from foo. It was again cloned. Uh, its resource again got cloned for assignment to x. x's own resource had to be destructed. And finally, again, the temporary object has to get destructed. Right. So it's a whole lot of construction destruction going on. Wherein you can think that uh, what you actually needed uh, is to is to uh, get the resource that uh, foo was returning. Right. So this is this is where this basically, I mean, conceptually, if you look at, you are not looking at a copy. You are looking more like a move. You want to move that resource computed in foo into the resource in X. So C++ uh, introduces a move semantics using a very new kind of reference. OK, so let us uh, slowly get into that. Uh, it rather obviously it would be OK and much more efficient if we could swap these pointers, right? Because we are 
taking the pointer from the temporary object returned by foo making a copy clone based on whatever that pointer points to then releasing whatever is held by x and then setting it here and then again releasing whatever uh, that temporary object uh, <coughs> objects resource was instead what we could do is swap the resource pointers between x and the temporary because whatever is in x has to be get destructed and the temporary object will destruct that because it is a temporary object so we could and to whatever was there in the temporary object was getting cloned and then set to x so what we could simply do is swap them just interchange the resource in x and the resource in temporary then what happens is automatically temporary's destructor will destruct x as original resource because it was that is that is the semantics it has to do in other words in the special case that the right hand side of the assignment is an r value we want the copy assignment operator to act something like this not like clone a resource release this and then destruct set and then destruct but you can just swap these two the right hand side resource and the existing resource you could just swap them and let the destructor take care of course you'll have to be careful because uh, if it is uh, if the right hand side is not an r value that means what is r value r value is something which is computed from an expression and so anything that is computed from an expression is a temporary so it's created for computing the expression and then destroyed after it has been used that is not something which happens with a declared variable which is with an with an l value so in the particular case where the right hand side is an r value which is very very often we could do this swapping business and uh, let the destructor of the temporary object take care of releasing the original resource and you do not need any additional construction destruction that you needed a copy construction so this is called the move semantics uh, but this behavior has to be conditional because uh, copy will uh, happen if you are taking a constant reference copy will happen for a r value expression value or for an l value but this can happen only for an r value so to denote that you write a copy assignment operator with a parameter which is uh, written not with 1 ampersand but with 2 ampersand this is not a typo this is a new feature so use 2 ampersands here when you do that that means that the right hand side what you are copying from is an r value so what uh, the this uh, move assignment operator now we'll call it now it's no more copies move of assignment operator will do it will simply swap the resource the current resource this pointer mp resource and rhs dot mp resource it'll just swap them so actually the right hand uh, side um, uh, the right hand side object which you are copying from will get changed but that is an r value so you know after this move has happened that object is going to get destroyed anyway so it will in turn destroy the original resource and you don't need to make additional construction and destruction and this is uh, this is also a reference and this is known as the r value reference because it can refer only to r values not to l values right so move semantics is realized by this r value reference which naturally you can see that there are thousands and thousands of places where we uh, really copy something from an r value which can be uh, realized by this move semantics relieving you of several unnecessary temporary reconstructions and destructions and therefore I, as i said this, le this leads to a huge uh, improvement in the efficiency of the language right it's not uh, only about uh, merely having a finer semantic distinction but this actually leads to a uh, heavy efficiency of the language and naturally type system now we'll have to work
to make this deduction of R value and L value. So to understand the R value reference uh, in in a little bit more depth, uh, let us uh, again go back to C. Uh, here, L value is an expression that may appear on the left or on the right hand side of an expression in C an L value can be on the left, it can be on the right, it has an address. Whereas an R value is an expression that can only appear on the right hand side of the expression. So if I declare int uh, A initialized with 42, B with 43, and I do B assigned A or A assigned B, then <coughs> all, <coughs> all of these are okay, because both A and B are uh, L values, right? Here again, A is an L value, A star B, A times B is an R value, but it occurs on the right hand side, so it's okay. So, A times B is an R value, so I can use it uh, like int C initialized with uh, A star B, because it's occurring on the right hand side of an assignment or right hand side as, as an initializer here actually. But I cannot write A star B assigned 42 because I'm using uh, an R value on the left hand side of the assignment. So whatever is A star B is a temporary object which does not have a persistent memory binding. So I cannot make an assignment uh, of 42 to that. Right? So that's, that's a typical C semantics. <clears throat> Let's move to C++. What we did in C++, we introduced uh, references. So with the introduction of references, an end value is an expression that refers to a memory location. Very simple thing. And allows us to take the address of that memory location via the ampersand operator. That's an L value. An R value is an expression that is not an L value. Anything else, any other value is an R value. Right? You can just look at it. That's it. So these are the L values. Uh, int initialized uh, with 42. You int uh, assigned 42. This uh, pointer P initialized with uh, ampersand I. Foo is a function that returns a reference to an integer. So now you can uh, write things like this, which you could not write in C. Foo assigned 42 because uh, since this has returned a reference, this is an L value, this has an address, and therefore I can assign it to that. You have seen these examples. You can also do this kind of an assignment. You can Take uh, uh, foo is a is a is an L value because uh, foo is a reference, so I can take the address of that and assign it here. Right? Assign it as a, as a pointer. Uh, in terms of R value, <coughs> then just see that uh, in foo bar, I've slightly changed the return type. I've changed it to from reference. I've changed it to value. Uh, I mean, return by value. So it returns an integer. And uh, there's a variable j initialized. Now I do j assign foobar. This is this is perfectly fine because foobar <coughs> is an R value. It's returning a temporary int object. So this is a this does not have an address. So it's an R value. But uh, if I try to do this, this is not allowed because foobar is an R value, so it does not have an address. So I cannot take address of it. In in physical terms, what you mean is uh, foo bar is a temporary integer value returned from foo bar. So this will vanish as soon as uh, this initialization or assignment has happened. So there is no memory binding available for it. I cannot use it as an L value and take address of it. So this is this will be an error, right? So that is the difference between L value and R value that, uh, I mean, you knew this, but I just wanted to highlight uh, in terms of the R value reference. So in with this, uh, uh, the R value reference is, uh, if X is any type, then X ampersand ampersand is called an R value reference to X. And ordinary reference now, in earlier C++ had a reference, we are so familiar with it. So to distinguish that, we often call it an L value reference now, because it indeed it refers to L values. So L, R value reference is a type that behaves much like the ordinary reference, L value reference, but with several 
exceptions. The most important one is that when it comes to function overload resolution, you can now resolve functions based on whether the parameter is a R value reference or it's an L value reference. So I can have two versions of uh, foo overloaded with the same parameter type x reference, but one is a L value reference and the other is an R value reference. Now you have x defined of x, you have the function uh, foo bar which returns an object of type x. Now foo, if you call foo x, then the question is which of these functions will get bound. Now x is an L value. So when you have a conflict uh, between whether it's an L value or R value, if you have an L value, it will be the L value parameter to which it will be bound. So this function will get called, calls foo x ampersand, the ordinary reference. But if you call foo with foo bar, what is foo bar? Foo bar is returning a temporary object x. It is an R value. It does not have an address. So when you call that, then the second signature of foo, which is using a R value reference, will get called. So this is this is in the crux of it, the basic understanding of R value reference. <clears throat> a, so it it kind of allows R value reference uh, kind of allow function to branch at compile time by overload resolution. So now we can see that there are. Um, and we have seen uh, overload resolution as a as a type uh, inferencing checking mechanism, and uh, you can see that there are further additions to that based on the type of a value being either an L value reference or an R value reference. Right? I'm sorry. So here are a a set of uh, examples. This is more for your practice. So in that context of uh, the function bar, which returns uh, a temporary object x, so call to bar will be an R value, and function fun, which is called in the con, uh, which returns uh, a reference to an x object, so call to fun will actually be an L value, right? So if you call uh, foo with uh, ordinary reference then calling it on bar will be an error because this is an R value. So this would be an error. But uh, the calling it with fun will be OK. If you do the same thing uh, here with const now, fun of course would be fine, but bar would call to bar would also be fine because what it will do, we, we have known that uh, if we had to call, uh, pass any reference parameter, which is an R value, which is a temporary, we will make it const. So it will make sure that it nothing happens if that temporary is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it is not allowed that temporary is changed because it is going to get changed. It is going to get destroyed. So if you use const, both are okay. Now, if you have uh, both of these uh, together, this is how they will bind. The call to bar will bind to the const and call to fun will bind to the non-const. Uh, if you have a R value reference, then if you call it with bar, then it will be okay because uh, bar call to bar is an R value because it's just returning a temporary object. Whereas call to fun will be an error because it is an L value. So you cannot pass an L value as a R value reference. So on, so forth. So the resolutions uh, happen here. You can see what happens with const and uh, R value reference and what happens with three of them. So this is, uh, I mean, just uh, for the understanding that this is the R value reference that you have in uh, C++. So with this, now a an efficient uh, C++ class could, could have two kinds of copy assignment uh, operator and two variants of uh, copy constructor. One of them, the classical one, 
will be called the copy assignment operator the other one is uh, move assignment operator similarly you have copy constructor and you have move constructor so you can you can do the but the only difference being that when you do that move assignment you just do a swap between the resource that you currently have and the resource that you are getting from the right hand side right so these are um, um, these are uh, some some of the this is a more detailed example of this so building a string class these are constructor which takes a pointer to character so c style string it takes and uh, then it does the allocation for it copies the string and so on all that it has to do uh, the destructor it has to destroy the string if it is uh, allocated then you have a copy constructor which does this whole thing it you know creates the new space uh, for the object that you are copying from and uh, it then makes a copy of this and you have next what is a move constructor wherein you don't make all this copy you just take the resource s.ptr and set it to ptr the current object that's it and then you set s.ptr to null ptr because you know this is a move construction so the original object did not have any resource that is cre getting created new so your conceptualization is the original object's pointer ptr was a null one right so that is null pointer is a null ptr is a uh, constant defined in uh, uh, c++ specifically for null pointer for this purpose so you by this swap uh, wherever you are actually copying uh, strings which are r values you get rid of lot of this over it similarly here you have the copy assignment operator next you have the move assignment operator and you have a function gen str which returns you a string so it it actually construct a string and returns you so you can see that uh, from this uh, c style string ptr it will construct object s and then it will return s so it will make a copy construction of the string and uh, destroy this uh, local s and then give you that temporary object as gen str so you can you can see what will what will happen in terms of when you do s assignment gen str here right so uh, with the blue when you when you do that so or you you know when you um, initialize with the object from gen str in both these cases uh, what you, you can benefit by doing a, <clears throat> by uh, making uh, a, a, a r value being used here in the construction of object u so you would make use of the move constructor as you move, make use of the move constructor which means that the temporary that is uh, been returned from gen str that pointer will get set to null and you simply get its pointer you don't have to copy it like when you do string t initialized with s where uh, s is a is a string it is an l value and therefore you have to make a copy construction for it and later on release that so this is the difference and this is just to show uh, that if you want, uh, if you if you specifically want to treat an L value as an R value, I mean, I'm, uh, as a as a as an R value in the context of R value reference or as an R value, you could do that by that. So here, uh, you are making an assignment of S to U. If you made an assignment from S to U, you will call the copy assignment operator. But uh, you could say this is this is a this is a function given in uh, this this is a built into the language is you can do move which says that uh, treat the l value as an r value so this becomes now an r value this becomes an r value reference so you could just 
uh, said it to you, which means, so what it means is through this, you are actually achieving a swapping of the pointers between the U and the S. So this will call the uh, move uh, assignment operator, uh, which will just uh, swap this. So that swap is exactly the only thing that will happen. I've written here different C out statements so that you can stress, uh, trace through them and understand them better. I think I'll uh, stop uh, here uh, because uh, this is universal reference is more complicated. We don't want to get into that. Uh, so let me see if there is any questions uh, from you. Any questions, friends? Actually, as you go from uh, going to more of C++, 11, then 14, 17, current version is C++ 20, more and more uh, such uh, semantic expansions uh, are being done. Uh, besides, of course, other things, a uh, lot of template uh, being added and so on. And uh, these are all being possible because of the strong type system. And uh, we have learned the core of it that uh, there's a formal deduction you can make for inferencing the type of an expression. Then depending on the language rules, so you check for the compatibility of types uh, or you do resolution of uh, overloaded symbols or you do structural compatibility of unrelated types or you do you know, things like auto decal type, which uh, certainly are features to improve productivity or some kind of a move semantics R value reference, which is a programming efficiencies being produced. So uh, very interestingly that uh, it, is, it is true that the language is getting bigger as it goes uh, from one generation to the next. But uh, interestingly, the compiled code that it is producing is getting more and more efficient. Uh, so so it's, it's kind of the most efficient language to uh, implement uh, programs. I mean, if, if you rightly use all these features, of course, I mean, you, in the context of C++11 also, you can write a C++03 code. Like using a C++ compiler, you can write a perfectly pure C code. That's, that's the programmer's responsibility. But the type system, or the evolution of the type system is at the heart of uh, the, the development of modern programming languages. Right? So I just wanted to give glimpses of this. Uh, any other question? Any question as such? No? OK, then. Uh, so we will uh, uh, end our discussion on uh, type system uh, here. And uh, I will now uh, go on to the next uh, topic, which is actually handling the semantics. Let me. Put up the presentation for it. Uh, so, uh, is, is the presentation visible? Hello, is the presentation visible? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Shoman, this uh, uh, this presentation has not been shared as yet, right? This module. Shoman, are you there? I, th I think it has not been shared. Uh, okay, we'll we'll share it after this class. Uh, fine. <clears throat> so now, so we have come a come a long long way by now. We have. Uh, had, a, had a deep look into the mathematical framework of Lambda, uh, its semantics, its typing, uh, its introduction in modern programming languages, and the type systems which are based on this framework and then extended based on the language uh, features. Uh, this is the kind of the mm, 
beginning of the uh, end of the understanding that we are leading to or in, in, end of this uh, principles uh, course is uh, to talk about semantics. So we'll talk uh, at length about uh, semantics of uh, actual programming languages. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the formalism which is uh, available in terms of semantics based on the lambda calculus. And uh, then in the next uh, uh, modules, we will talk about the specific semantics, how the specific semantics of different uh, contemporary programming languages or very well-known features can be handled. So uh, this is kind of uh, the, the coverage. We start uh, with the discussion on, uh, uh, I mean, this is what we are trying to introduce. But before that, I'll talk about the general semantic features. So denotational semantics is, is basically what we're, where we get, want to get to. Uh, these are some of the references that you could use. So the question is, uh, when you are defining a programming language, what are the main characteristics that you look at? I mean, think about, uh, think yourself as a programming language designer, say. Because now you have, you are learning the principles of uh, programming languages in general. So you are getting empowered to design your own language. So three main characteristics. Uh, the first is syntax.
am i am i audible now yes sir you are audible so sorry i had lost uh, connection i had to set up a different link i'll i'll get back to the presentation so back with the presentation so i was talking about uh, <clears throat> the <clears throat> characteristics of programming languages uh, one is of course uh, the syntax and then you have the semantics what is the meaning of the program i take a think of a very simple example uh 3 is assigned to x a variable now in fortran the original fortran fortran 2 fortran 4 uh, this was a statement which means that uh, if 3 is assigned to x the value 3 is set to the location bound to x that's it in c this semantics was changed to mean that uh, 3 is assigned to x is an expression which means uh, it actually has a value which is the value that is being assigned so x assigned uh, 3 has a value 3 and the fact that x is being set to the memory location uh, um, uh, i mean uh, 3 is being set to the memory location bound to x is a side effect so there is a difference in the in the semantics so the moment you could do that uh, it became possible that you could write uh, say x assigned 3 within parenthesis and do plus 2 and think about having a valid uh, value so so semantics is is something which is uh, very very critical in terms of defining the meaning of uh, the syntax that you provide so uh we talk about the static semantics which uh, um, uh, tell that uh, which programs that are syntactically valid that is correct by the syntax is semantically valid as well that is which are type correct something is semantically valid if it is type correct and that is what is the role of the static semantics whereas the dynamic semantics tell us how to interpret the meaning of the valid program so uh, if i'm uh, ass assigning uh, say an object of class a to an object of class b where class a and b are uh, not related if i'm making such an assignment then it is semantically st by static semantics is not valid because it is it will not pass through the type system it's not type correct but uh, even if uh, it is uh, statically semantically correct that the type system allows it for example i can do a forced cohesion of uh, types from to assign a to b the dynamic semantics will tell us what is the meaning of that assignment right so that's a that's a meaning of valid program so that's that's more the the dynamic semantics is more the point that we are trying to get into now we have done A, a significant part of the static semantics in terms of the type uh, inferencing and type validation and so on of course there is a third dimension of uh, of a programming language which is the pragmatics of it that is what is the usability of the language as we can see that uh, there are hundreds of languages even even uh, we see that uh, in terms of the very strong popular use there are uh, uh 10 20 languages whether it's uh, c++ or it's java or it's python or c sharp or say object c or go or uh real different kinds of uh, this languages and de depending on the usability depending on what kind of uh, situations you are trying to cater to whether it is more important to improve uh, the productivity of a large number of developers or it is important to have very high efficiency or it is uh, the platform independence that you are looking at or it is a certain kind of uh, say graphics primitives which you want to support uh, strongly whatever is that requirement based on that pragmatics based on that ease of implementation based on what kind of applications you are uh, trying to make in that you design your programming language so these are the three dimensions of which uh, 
Syntax, so we have not discussed uh, in this course. That's a part of the compiler course, which is an easier part. Uh, it's a semantics that we are primarily concerned with, and we have uh, come to a certain level in terms of the static semantics. Now we will get more into the dynamic semantics and talk about the pragmatics from time to time based on different situations. So this is uh, the, the core of uh, programming language definition. Now, if you look at the uh, use of the semantic specification, every language has a huge, like uh, C++ uh, currently has about 1,500 page uh, standards document, much of which is actually semantic specification. That is a precise standard for computer implementation so that, uh, you know, what I understand, what you understand, and what the machine understands are the same thing. And how should it be implemented on different machines? Because different machines have different kind of uh, processor architecture, different kind of processor resources, and so on. So how the semantics has to be, uh, how the language to be implemented there so that you have semantic consistency. So that is the first purpose of uh, semantic specification. That's the reason you have a, a very well-documented uh, standard for every language. Then, uh, of course, it is uh, useful for user documentation. What is the meaning of a program? Uh, given a particular combination of language features, semantic specification will tell you that. It is certainly a tool for design and analysis, uh, how the features to be used, the language definitions to be tuned so that it can be implemented efficiently. Like right now, we talked about uh, uh, copy semantics vis-a-vis uh, -vis move semantics. So you will analyze and see, well, these are the places where move semantics can be used and will make it more efficient. So you will probably make use of them in the R value context. Uh, it certainly is an input to the compiler generator because compilers are auto-generated. So uh, there has to be a reference implementation which should be obtainable from the semantic specification. Right, so this is, uh, these are, I mean, kind of, so we are starting with the context that there is a specification that will be available to us. And based on that, we are going to define the dynamic semantics of languages. Now, this whole process is, can be done in multiple different ways or has been attempted in multiple different ways. And uh, each one of them is called a semantic style. I mean, what is the style? What are the presumptions and what are the guarantees that you produce. So here we are going to talk about, uh, there are many, but we are going to talk about the top three here and uh, more specifically on the denotational one. So the first is operational semantics, where you say that any program written in the given language is equivalent to a program in the abstract machine you know, some abstract machine because on which you are trying to target that uh, particular translation of the program. So this is, I mean, uh, many of you who have uh, known compiler, who have implemented compilers have done this operational semantics. So you are uh, trying to translate, you are trying to give semantics to a for loop. So you have a complete control flow semantics. You have a complete semantics in terms of what happens in the first component of the first expression of the for loop, second expression of the for loop, third expression of the for loop, the body of the for loop, and so on. And accordingly, using some vehicular language, you rewrite that semantics. See, the, the again, the core issue that we discussed at the beginning of lambda calculus is that uh, whenever you have to talk about semantics, you need another language, right? So, well, maybe you are writing a Java compiler, you are in C++, so which means that you are trying to express uh, the uh, semantics of uh, Java in terms of uh, C++ program, which use certain abstract machine model. Uh, typically, this is simple to implement and is most prevalent in terms of uh, language compilers. But it is very hard to reason about because all these uh, implementations of uh, semantics uh, using whatever vehicular language you have is uh, actually ad hoc. 
so it is error prone i mean uh, the compiler writer may make some mistake in terms of uh, interpreting the semantics and accordingly uh, certainly you may get a wrong semantics implemented in the compiler we often see that compilers do have bugs compilers do have differences uh, we say that this program behaves like this uh, you will come back and say no in my compiler it's behaving like this so it's hard to reason about them the second approach the second style is known as axiomatic style axiomatic semantics which says that uh, look at the program as a set of properties you know a kind of uh, you know predicate uh, logic clauses or something like that so you treat the program or the semantics as this set of properties that any program you write has to satisfy these properties and only then whatever satisfies those properties is the semantics of the program now we will we'll take examples of e each of these don't worry about the abstract discussion right now but it's important to have the abstract discussion so the program turns out to be a set of properties and uh, it makes it naturally very difficult to implement it is it is it is very difficult to you know uh, write something which is uh, which in that way is compliant to a set of uh, properties always makes it quite complex to implement but it is good for proving theorems about programs it is uh, if you if your program is uh, compliant to a set of properties then uh, if your every element in the program is compliant to certain properties then it is much easier to uh, make deductions about what your program is doing it is possible to mathematically prove or disprove the correctness of a program and this is gaining a lot of ground these days particularly because in most uh, dynamical systems so much of the components are becoming software i think i mentioned that uh, uh, boeing and airbus uh, aircrafts have uh, over 70% software components now so which are basically algorithms written in terms of certain language and uh, naturally the bugs in them makes the means that uh, those systems malfunction and uh, certainly flying is a mission critical uh, application right uh, any failure in the aircraft could be disastrous could lead to loss of human life so you want those programs to be correct in every situation a situation that you have designed it for exceptional situation that you have been able to conceive which is mostly what operational semantics lead you to but also of uh, situations which we may not have been able to even think of right so can you mathematically prove that a program is correct axiomatic semantics tries to support that paradigm so therefore there are uh, very restrictive language subsets which are treated axiomatically but in general for a large language or for a large compiler it gets very very difficult to write the axiomatic semantic way we'll see examples of that finally uh, you look at uh, a semantic style where you think about every program as a mathematical denotation typically a function okay right? and which facilitates reasoning right if you have to do that then naturally every function need domains right so if you have to semantically express your program in terms of functions you need to first define a set of semantic domains whose behavior are predefined it could be integer domain it could be real number domain it could be complex number domain it could be a product domain and so on and so forth and then express in terms of those so it is not easy to define suitable uh, semantic domains but much work has gone into doing that and that is where this becomes uh, visualizing programs in terms of functions or mathematical denotation come very close to our lambda calculus so you can think about uh, every program eventually as a lambda expression and then do deductions based on that so these are the three main approaches we'll start uh, with the with the first one we'll try to 
give you very simple examples uh, because I understand that uh, not all of you may have actually done a compiler. So we'll take a pathological example to illustrate the difference between operational and axiomatic semantics and then get into the denotational one. So that's the scope of what we'll discuss in this module. Okay. So let us uh, define a very simple uh, problem, which is a programming language of binary numerals with addition. So <laughs> we want to define a programming language where the elements are binary numerals, right? numbers written in binary, and it has an addition operator. Right? So first the grammar. We say, what is the grammar? We say, grammar has a meta symbol. Okay? We call non-terminal typically B, which could be zero, binary numeral zero. It could be one, or it could be whatever B is padded with a zero after that, suffixed with a zero. Or it could be whatever B could generate suffix with a one. So these four rules will uh, generate any kind of binary string, strings of zeros and one, which are the domain of numerals that we are talking of. Then we say that there is a binary addition operator shown by this uh, rounded plus uh, symbol, where two such binary uh, numerals can be taken and added to get a new binary numeral. Right? So this is this is the language. It's, we have taken a pathologically simple language. Points to note that uh, empty string is not in the language because if there's nothing, it's not a binary numeral. So we have made sure that it does not generate an empty string. Also, we do not use parentheses in the abstract syntax, although the parentheses may be needed to distinguish between the associativity of the binary operator. There is only one operator, so there is no question of precedence. But associativity will be in, involved if uh, more than one occurrence of binary operators are there, one after the other. So for our uh, understanding of the expression, we'll use parenthesis to see if it is if the first one has to happen first or the second one has to happen first. But in terms of the abstract syntax, it is just this language. Right? So this is this is the premise on which we are trying to see the semantics. So first, the operational semantics is a collection of rules that define a possible evaluation or execution of the program. What is operational semantics? It will generate an abstract machine program. No? So how the programs are executed or how the comp computer will operate with them. So here are the rules that uh, we define. The rules say that uh, Epsilon, see, it is not there in the final language, but they are just being used to define the rule because I need an exit condition for the recursion. So epsilon added with x is x, is a rule, obvious. Intuitively, it's quite clear. x added with epsilon is x, so there's, they have no effect. 0x is x when x is not equal to epsilon, which which is the common rule we say that the leading zeros do not <coughs> add to the value of the binary numeral. So 0x is x. Then you say if I have x and y, and from that using the syntactic rules, if I get x0 and y0, and if I add them, then it is same as adding x with y and putting a 0 at the end. Right? This is quite obvious, right? Zero with zero will get uh, added and rest of the x, y will get added. Right? So I can add x with y and then pad the zero on the right. If I have x1, that is x padded with one and y padded with zero and add them, then it is adding x with y and zero and one will give me a one. So it is adding x with y and a padding of one. Similarly, if it is x0 added with y1, I'll have addition of x with y padded with 1. Finally, if I have uh, x1, y1, then 1 plus 1 gives me 1, 0. Right? 
it gives me one zero. So which means that uh, zero is produced at the rightmost place, and one is the carry to the addition. So what it means in terms of binary addition that I have to add x with y, and along with that I have to add one. So it is x addition y addition one is what I have, and then the padded with the zero that the rightmost uh, binary position that I have got. Right, so these are the rules, seven rules of my operational semantics. So with that, I'll try to give semantics to the each and every binary numeral string. So let's say we try to use this. So here the rules are given again. This is just for your easy reference. I want to say that one zero one plus one 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 is same as one one zero zero. So let me try to do this. So this is the semantics. Semantics of the left hand side string is the right hand side string. Okay? So this is the semantics. So if I do this, then what do I have? I have the rightmost uh, bit as one. So it adds. So it matches with rule seven, where x is one zero and y is one one. X is one zero, y is one one. I have one with each. So I apply this rule. So I have x one zero added with y one one added with one and padded to zero. Now I let's say I take it as left associative. So I need to add these two one zero with one one. One zero with one one matches rule six. Right? X is uh, one and y is one. So and it is padded with one. So it is addition of one one, padded with one, and uh, rest rest of it remains the same. Now what is one plus one plus one? This matches rule seven, provided I take x to be epsilon and y to be epsilon. So I take x to be epsilon, y to be epsilon, and match with this rule. So I get epsilon plus epsilon plus one, and then I have a padded zero. So that goes below before this one. So I have zero one, and I have epsilon plus epsilon plus one zero one plus one coming from here. Finally, a zero at the end. Now epsilon plus epsilon could be evaluated either by rule one or by rule two. It gives x. So it gives epsilon. So this gives me epsilon plus one. Rest of it does not change. Epsilon plus x is x. Rule one. So epsilon plus one is one. So I get one padded with zero one. So I have one zero one plus one. Whole thing padded with zero. Now the right uh, rightmost symbols are one here. So again rule seven. So in rule seven x is one zero. And y is epsilon. X is one zero. Y is epsilon. I have a one added to this, and a zero padded here. Ten plus epsilon goes by rule two, which I'm sorry, not ten. One zero plus epsilon uh, gives me one zero, which is by rule two. So this becomes uh, one zero plus one padded with zero zero. One zero plus one uh, goes by zero one rule six, where x is one, y is epsilon. So it's one plus epsilon. I have a one coming from here, so that gets before this zero zero. I have one plus epsilon here. One plus epsilon is one, so I get one one zero zero. Okay. So you can see that uh, the operational semantics told the term rewriting rules. So these are basically term rewriting rules. We are taking one term and replacing it by doing that. I was able to show that one zero one plus one 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 is one one zero zero. Right. So that's a that's a basic uh, meaning of uh, the semantics. So there are more examples <coughs> which I can uh, leave for you to. To work on one one zero zero plus one zero one zero is one zero one one zero. Similarly, one zero one one zero one 
plus 1001 is this. So you can practice on this using these rules. You'll be able to show this operational semantics. So the operational semantics specifies the behavior of a programming language by defining a simple abstract machine. So if we go back, this is my abstract machine. The set of rules is my abstract machine, which is telling me that uh, given a pattern, how to rewrite it to the next pattern. And in, in that way, I will finally come to a resultant pattern which cannot be reduced any further. I mean, much like the concept is much like uh, the uh, lambda reduction uh, method. It comes to an irreducible form. And that, I say, is the meaning of this expression 1100 plus 1010. This machine is abstract in the sense that it uses the terms of the language as its machine code rather than some low-level microprocessor instruction set. It is using the grammar itself. It's using the symbols itself. And the state of the machine is just a term. So at any, any point, this was the initial state of the machine. This is the next state of the machine. This is the next state of the machine. So that's an abstract machine. And it is actually executing because you are applying rules. You are doing term rewriting. So these are the different states when you finally come to a final state where no further rule can be applied. And that is the semantics of your. So the machine's behavior is defined by transition functions for each state, which either gives the next state by performing a step of simplification on the term or declare that the machine has halted. So these are the transfer, transformation functions or the term rewriting functions, which uh, keeps on simplifying the expression till you come to an expression where you declare that the machine has halted and you have the final semantics. The meaning of a term t can be taken to be the final state that the machine reaches when started with t as the initial state. So this is what we have seen. Right? Now at this point, um, uh, obviously, I will go back again. Obviously, uh, um, uh, some of you could argue that I mean, uh, even if I go to an er go to the earlier example, which is simpler, you could say, okay, why are you do doing all this? This is uh, five. This is seven. Seven plus five is twelve, and this is twelve. Right. Now, mind you, that is not something which uh, uh, we want to do, because the fact that one zero one is five is a semantics itself, and it is a it is a five because I am assuming certain domain in which I can interpret this to be five or 111 is 7, because I'm interpreting it in a domain where it is represented by 7. I could, uh, well, uh, for that matter, uh, say that uh, I'm a, say, base, uh, say, base 3 number system in which I have written this. And uh, it could mean that uh, actually 101 is 10. It is 3 squared plus 1. So it depends on the on the domain in which. So it, without taking the recourse to any other domain, if you just uh, look at a transformational system, which that operational semantics is, you get to the semantics of the program. Of course, if you if you try to do that interpretation denotationally using certain semantics domain, it has to be consistent with that. That is a that is an additional requirement. So this was the operational uh, semantics part of it. Let me stop and ask if there are questions on this. Is there any question, friends? Okay, no. So let me go back uh, to the slide again. Uh, next, uh, we take a look into the axiomatic semantics. In the axiomatic semantics, we set a meaning of binary numerals through a set of laws or axioms. 
these laws and axioms are what the binary numerals must satisfy mind you these are not term rewriting laws but uh, these are laws that any binary numeral has to satisfy hmm. for example let's say there are at least two possible interpretation of a formula like uh, equality x equal to one one is what we can say is a syntactic equality so <clears throat> if we compare the appearance of x and appearance of y x is 101 and y is 000101 then syntactic equality is false obvious because they are not syntactically the same or there could be semantic equality that is i have x plus 2 plus 2 as x and i have Four as y, they are syntactically unequal, but semantically equal. Both of them mean the same thing. So in axiomatic, this is this semantic equality is what we look at. Right. Now, so here we are defining a set of semantic equality rules. these are not rewriting rules these are not transformational but these are saying that these are truth about the binary numeral system that if i add 0 with 0 i'll get a 0 if i add 0 with 1 i'll get a 1 if i add 1 with 1 i'll get a 1 0 if i pad a 0 to left on x i'll get an x or not i'll get an x rather padding 0 to the left of x is semantically equal to being x x added to y is semantically equal to y added to x we commonly say this is a commutativity rule right we say x added to the addition result of y and z is same as adding x to y and adding that result to z associativity rules we say x0 added with y0 is semantically equivalent to x added to y and padding with a zero similar thing for 10 pattern similar for 11 pattern we do not do a 01 pattern because we have the commutativity rule so you can apply commutativity rule to get the x0 added with y1 which will be same as x added with y1 so now you have nine different semantic equivalence semantic equality rules and your axiomatic semantics will uh, try to tell you that what are the expressions in the binary numeral language that are semantically equal for example you have 11 plus 10 this is semantically equal to 1 plus 1 padded with 1 which is semantically equal to 1 plus 1 is semantically equal to 10 padded with 1 which is 101 right so this is by this is what you get by applying the axioms of the language the semantic equality rules of the language again we can interpret this deduction as 3 plus 2 is equal to 5 but uh, semantics does not say this when you say 3 plus 2 is 5 you are making additional assumption that uh, there is a semantic domain where 11 stands for 3 where 10 stands for 2 and 101 stands for 5 so all that it is saying that 11 plus 10 is semantically equivalent to 101 so that's the that's the property based definition so you can do the same thing we did uh, earlier in terms of term rewriting but these are now in terms of semantic equality so you take 101 addition 111 you'll apply the rule 9 uh, so you get 10 add 11 add 1 padded with 0 then you take these two you have the zero one rule which says you do not have a zero one rule you will apply that using 
the um, this he will commute at them get 1 1 plus 1 0 then match with rule 8 to get the next step in this way you can say that all of these expressions are semantically equivalent and the simplest of them 1 1 0 0 is the meaning of this whole expression 1 0 1 plus 1 1 1 again for the earlier examples this is worked out uh, here in terms of semantic uh, equality you can check them uh, these are questions that i'll leave with you uh, you can uh, respond in the next class or send me by mail that uh, in the axiomatic semantics the empty string is not used it is used in the operational semantics but is not used in the axiomatic semantics what is the reason for that you should think through and uh, why we do not obtain the operational semantics simply by changing uh, equality to term rewriting like the rules look very similar but uh, they are on axiomatic semantics, they are semantic equality rules. In operational semantics, they are term rewriting rules. They are very similar, but you cannot directly get the operational semantics simply by changing the meaning of these rules per se. Right? So why is that? So I will not uh, answer this uh, now. Uh, I will hope that you will be able to give the answer in some form. So axiomatic semantics takes a more direct approach to these laws uh, it defines the behavior of programs and then derives the laws from this definition so axiomatic methods take the laws themselves as a definition of the language so meaning of the term is just what can be proved about it so we through the equivalence of these uh, set of terms we have been able to prove that certain term is equal to certain other term and that is what is the meaning that you take. Several practical design approaches uh, also use these. Um, you may have come across invariants, you may have come across assertions uh, about design by contract. These are all you know, examples of axiomatic semantics that uh, are prevalent in programming language or in the design paradigm. I mean, just to free ourselves from the binary numerals, you might think it's too pathological. So let us just uh, look at an example of axiomatic semantics for a data structure. Let's say stack. What is a stack? There are, uh, you know, different ways of uh, looking at it different uh, variants in terms of uh, how you implement a stack can be of any element type and so on but the bottom of it the core definition of a stack is it is a lifo it is a container which is last in first out anything that you add to it will be the first to go out right so let's see if we if we can try to write this uh, behavior in terms of an axiomatic semantics. So, just for being able to express the semantic rules, I have taken recourse to some specific domains. You can take it as any other element domain also, but I have just taken it to be a natural number. So, it's a stack of numbers. So, one domain is natural number collection of all natural numbers one domain is a stack itself which is any stack of natural numbers including the empty stack and one domain is a boolean values which we'll use in terms of defining the stack operations so these are the five operations you know which define the stack data structure that there is a way to construct the stack that is out of nothing on an empty domain, I can construct a stack. I get an empty stack, but this is what I can do. There's a new stack. There's a push method, a push interface, 
push operation, which takes a natural number because it's a stack of natural numbers and a stack and returns you a stack. So that is, you can push an element, add an element. You can do a pop where you take out the topmost element. So given a stack, you get another stack. You can check the top. That is given a stack, you can check the topmost element. You get a natural number because that's the number. That's the domain on which the stack is built. And you have an empty method which takes a stack and tells you if it is true or false in that it is, it is empty or not empty. So if the stack is empty, it does not have an element, then it will return you a bool. Otherwise, it will uh, return you a true. Otherwise, it will return you a false. Naturally, we uh, know from our understanding that uh, doing pop or top on an empty stack is certainly not a meaningful operation. Often in implementation, we use functions like stackful does not exist here because mathematically a stack is an infinite data structure. Okay, so given the domain and the functions, let us try to write some axioms. You know. uh, <clears throat> the first axiom is push ns. If I push an element to a stack, what I get is not the original stack. It gets different. Right? So I can easily say that push ns is not equal to s. Pop s is not equal to s. If I take something out of a stack, it is not the original stack. If at the beginning, the stack was not empty. If empty s is false, pop s is not equal to s. Pop s is error if empty s is true. So actually, I mean, I should have mentioned, actually, I'm using a fourth domain, which is the error domain, which has a single value error, which uh, gives me the value error if I have an error. So it's an exception you can think of. So pop s on an empty stack is an error. Pop new stack is an error. Right, because new stack is necessarily empty. I don't need to check for anything. If I push n to s and then do a pop, that is if I push and then do pop, I get back the original stack. This is LIFO. Mind you, this rule is LIFO, right? Last in, first out. Top, if I do a push and check the top, I'll see the same element that I've last pushed. So push n s top on that is n. Top of s is error if the stack is empty, if empty s is true. Top of new stack is error. Empty push n s is false. If I push something to a stack, then it will always be non-empty. So empty push, empty on push n s is false. Empty on new stack will be true because new stack is always empty. Right? So if you look into this set of rules, these are called axioms because no matter how you implement your programming system, whether you are using an array to implement please, uh, please mute. Kindly mute. Please mute. Please mute. Please mute. Please, 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 please mute yourself. Kindly, please. Please mute yourself.
I'm sorry, so somebody had uh, got unmuted and a lot of noise was coming, so I had to mute the person. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, no matter how you implement a stack, whether it is a through an array or through a linked list or through a vector, whatever way you implement, whatever way you may have written the code for these five functions, these properties will always have to be satisfied. So that is the axiomatic view that you are not saying in a transformational manner in the operational semantic way that push will do this, then this, then this, and this is how the state of the machine will get transformed. It could be anything. That's, that's up to you. But whatever is implemented, whatever the semantics is, will have to satisfy these actions, satisfy these rules. If these axioms are satisfied, then your what you get is the semantics of the stack. Right? Whatever satisfies these axioms is a stack. Right? So that's that's a I mean it's a different way of saying that. So so that transforms the whole uh, process of semantics into a set of properties, set of rules, which are pretty mathematical in nature. So there could be uh, there are, uh, you know, theorem proving system, uh, automated deduction systems, which taking an implementation could try to prove these properties on them. And if they are proven on them, then uh, naturally you have a proven implementation of what you wanted to have as a stack. But the view becomes very different. These are, this does not directly tell you how to get the operational code in a machine. It's taking a completely different look. So axiomatic semantics are difficult for a standard compiler. It can, it can occasionally uh, put axiomatic conditions like assertions and so on, but it cannot totally behave axiomatically because it is not transformational. It does not finally give you a translated program, but it can ensure a strong set of properties that uh, any semantics has to follow, that any way you implement stack, these rules will have to get satisfied. So that's uh, that's the kind of uh, axiomatic view. Uh, I'll, I've, I'll leave these as uh, uh, assignments for you to write the axiomatic semantics for array or a priority queue or a queue or a single linked list. So different data structures or in different mathematical systems for which you can write the axiomatic semantics. Basically, you need to define an appropriate uh, domain. And on that, you need to define the set of axiomatic rules. Right? So this is, uh, so we, we looked at uh, the different, uh, two different uh, semantic styles, uh, specifically the operational uh, semantics, which is transformational, which is common, which is easy to write, uh, which is what the compilers typically do is you keep on translating uh, through an abstract uh, machine program to get the final uh, semantics, the final term, a term rewriting system, which is uh, very widely used in all compilers. And we took a look at the axiomatic semantic style where you look at the program or look at the system as a collection of rules, a collection of properties, which uh, the uh, terms will have to satisfy. So any concept could be in this way put in terms of mathematical properties and uh, more often you put them in the form so that they are provable properties and use a theorem prover to really say if an implementation is uh, correct, accurate, and so on. So these are the two uh, styles which are, have been prevalent. Uh, from next uh, uh, class, uh, we will go on to discussing the denotational style, which is a 
mathematical way of representing semantics in terms of semantic domains and uh, operations, which we'll have to first define and then uh, show how lambda calculus can really be helpful in terms of denoting the semantics of programming languages. So if there are no more questions, uh, I will close here today. Thank you all very much. Uh, uh, is there a question here? Shoman, uh, is it uh, tonight? Yes, sir. Today, EOD. Uh, today, EOD. So, uh, since there's a request, let's give them one more day. Okay. Yes, sir. Make, make it tomorrow, EOD. Okay, sir. That's fine, Nagesh. Yes, sir, it is okay. fine. Okay, good. Meet again on uh, next uh, Monday. I mean, just to, to remind you that on 24th, uh, that is uh, uh, next week, uh, we will uh, have uh, um, uh, we will have uh, the class test again on 24th. That is next uh, Wednesday. So for this, uh, we will go up to the uh, type system. The denotational semantics that I've started discussing today will continue and will not be a part of the uh, class test uh, syllabus. Right? So please prepare accordingly and uh, get ready for the class test. Thank you all very much. Have a nice time. Have a good day. Bye. Uh, hello, sir. Sir.